Okay, good morning to everyone. So we'll go ahead and get started. Uh, today's week 14, the end of week 14 today is the 13th. And um, the only, I've, I've just got a little bit of uh, material to cover from chapter 17, dealing with fiscal policy. And I just want to go over that. I've just got a couple slides really to go over. And then the majority of the time in the class, um, what I want to do is talk a, a bit more about the exam, which is coming up this week and be available a bit later today. So you should be able to see that. So I'm just trying to get the camera angle right here. So that's what we're going to do today. We're going to talk about the fourth exam. And I'll give you an overview as to what we're going to be looking at there. So exam four, and I'll talk about more. The next week, come back on Monday, uh, Tuesday, Tuesday, right? And uh, on four eighteen, and we're going to talk. We're going to go over the the first three exams. So we're going to review exams one to one, one through three, and cover any questions that you've got um, in the intro about that. So if you have questions about really anything in the class that's come up before now, this is a good time for you to um, ask those questions. Um, and you can do it anytime next week because we're going to be here. The following uh, class session on Thursday, we'll talk about the final exam and what to expect for that. And I'll try to make that final exam as, as available as early as I can so you've got the opportunity to take that. It'll be available like right after class is over, after we've had a chance to do it. And uh, I try to make it as, give you as much time as possible for that just because of the fact that it's the last week of the class. And I know that, or last week of the semester, and I know a lot of people have. I, I certainly am sensitive to that. I try to be, uh, you know, exams and papers and everything, you name it. So uh, I, I want to try to make, and this which is why I sort of dialed down the chapter count on the fourth exam, only three chapters that are, that are being covered. And I'll talk about those in a minute. Okay. All right. So let's go ahead and get started. Um, I know that uh, I waited a couple minutes to get going here just because I know there's a lot of construction going on on campus right now. And like, two of the ways in are sort of hamstrung by construction. So this is the time of year in which uh, it's impossible to drive around Albuquerque. So, um, so we're talking about fiscal policy, and um, fiscal policy deals with budget policy. In fact, I, I would urge you maybe to think about if you ever wonder what the term fiscal means, just think budget. Um, in fact, every use of the term fiscal that I can think of relates to budget. So, um, so that's one way to think about it. When we think about budgets, we're thinking about money coming in, money going out. Really straightforward as far as that goes. And when we're talking about the government's fiscal policy, we're talking about taxes coming in and government spending going out. And we're primarily talking about that the money going out, that G in the circular flow or in the uh, expenditures approach, C plus I plus G plus net exports. The only main difference here is the fact that in this chapter and our discussion of fiscal policy, it's going to relate mostly to federal spending as opposed to state spending. And I know, I think I mentioned this in class the other day that the G in our Probably more dominated by state spending as opposed to federal. And the reason we are talking in this fiscal policy discussion more about the federal government than the state government is that the federal, the state governments really don't have, even though they have fiscal policies, they've got budgets and taxes coming in, money going out, they don't really try to control the economy through stabilization policies. They're not trying to boost the economy locally. Uh, sometimes they do things to try to make that happen. That's certainly the case. Um, but it's oftentimes not intended to be a stabilizing effect. Even the largest state in California can't um, really influence the entire economy, and sometimes not even its own state economy, by trying to do things like boost the economy. Uh, through state spending, I know California and, I, and, and New Mexico uh, were looking at this, this, this rebate, this, uh, this, this rebate of the budget, and uh, it's it, as a way to sort of alleviate, you know, the governor has talked about alleviating high gas prices, and no doubt that's a good... Uh, uh, you know, a good way to, to explain it to, to people. Um, but it's not really intended to sort of deal with the business cycle overall. It's a federal government matter. So that's what we're really talking about there. Now, by the way, I think it's a great thing. I'm, I'm glad the state government is giving money back um, because you know, New Mexico is in a pretty good place in terms of budget right now. I think we should be happy. We haven't always been there. And uh, like a lot of states, a lot, most states are, you know, it's feast or famine when it comes to budgets. And so uh, we could do an entire semester on state budgets, but instead, we're really talking here about fiscal policy as it relates to the federal government. So when we talk about fiscal policy, I've got it up on the slides, up on the screen here, the question of timing issues and lag issues with fiscal policy. So here's the thing. When we talk about lags, we're talking about this idea of these lags being cumulative. By cumulative, I mean one leads into another, which leads into another, which leads into another. And so these sort of build on, on each other. So the first lag that we should talk about when it, as regards to fiscal policy is 
the recognition lag. That is the time it takes fiscal policymakers to recognize that there's even a problem. Okay. So if you consider the fact that, like in the well, probably most recent example, is is with the COVID epidemic, and and you know, it took a while to figure out what that was all about, frankly. And it was a non-economic event that was going to have economic consequences. And I think a lot of people simply didn't know what to make of it and whether happening. I know that I heard rumblings about COVID back before Christmas of 19 of 2019. And um, it was it was in China that moved its way to I think the west coast of the United States. And so people were wondering, was this going to be a thing? I don't think anybody that I know at least had an idea it would be as big as what it became. But obviously it had an economic effect, and it took the government a while to sort of figure, hey, there's a problem here. And it's nothing um, criticism of policymakers, it's just the fact sometimes it takes a while to recognize there's a problem. Uh, the most recent, the other most recent thing was probably the financial crisis, which began in 2007, where people started saying, hey, there's something really wonky going on in the bond market uh, for mortgage-backed securities. Now, we've got a lot of bad debt on, on the books of, of mortgage companies, and so what? And, and which now are owned by investors who bought the bonds, which are used to fund these things in the first place. And so it took people really a while, quite a while. I mean, probably a good year at least to figure out that hey, we've got a real problem here, and we need to do something about it. In fact, the economy went through a very serious recession, very steep, but it took a while to recognize what was happening. The second lag after recognizing what's going on. And by the way, we're talking about members of Congress and the president. Okay, so we're talking about elected officials, and it simply takes them time to re realize what's happening. The second lag is another add-on to the to the recognition lag because they're cumulative, and that's the administrative lag. It's the time it takes to figure out what to do about it, and they have to debate and formulate a policy. And because we're talking about 535 members of Congress and one president that uh, who don't always agree on everything. In fact, it's I mean, how can you even get a consensus on that many? Uh, there's a it's a subject of compromise, and that's just simply the way politics works. Is there's got to be give and take. I mean, this is all that I want, but I'm one senator from Montana, and I've got to give up to members of my own party, even who want something else. And so, this is sort of backroom kind of a lot of this stuff happens behind closed doors, frankly. I, mean, I know that, uh, and at the staff level, I know the people we we have heard from who work for, for congressional staffers say that a lot of the work really happens outside of the public purview. Back and forth talking about what to do. And uh, and I don't mean that in any kind of you know sinister kind of way. I'm, I'm just saying that these are the these are the kind of compromises that have to happen, but it takes time. So that there's a time element to it that adds to the already uh del the already the delay that already is there because of the recognition lag. And the third lag, which adds on further time, is the operational lag, or, or sometimes it's called the implementation lag, which I sort of prefer much better. It's a little easier to. Uh, to sort of grasp, but it's the idea that it takes time to, for any kind of policy to take effect. Now, and if you think about this, sometimes this lag can be a lot longer than what people anticipate, and it's a very maddening thing because you know what you need to do. You have got the policy approved by Congress, signed by the president, money is appropriate and ready to go, and yet it takes time for these things to take effect. If I, if I can recall, President Obama, in his first term, when he, and he inherited a very weak economy, coming out of the financial crisis, and there was a, a large stimulus plan called the American Recovery and Reinvestment Act, or ARA, it was $787 billion, big, big, big dollar figure, and he was sure that, that some of these projects that were approved were quote-unquote show already, meaning that we can get people working right away, it means paychecks in people's hands, orders of materials, workers moving, firms hiring and getting going, and therefore we get the recovery going. And we are dealing with long-term projects that need to be done anyway, and yet they take time. And so, so for instance, if Doniana County needs a runway, um, okay, well, that's fine. Good, good for Doniana County and um, at their airport. I assume there's an airport possibly. I don't think I've ever flown in one. Uh, but if, let's say they need a runway. Okay, great. And it puts people to work, but you've got surveys to do. You've got environmental studies to do. You've got to get the, the land graded and paved. You've got uh, you, you've got all kinds of issues regarding where did the, where the planes come in the land. And I assume they probably have figured that out. But I mean, you've got a lot of work to be done in the in the in the preparatory in preparation for this. And so it all takes time. And any kind of land development issue takes time, whether it's a highway, whether it's an extension to a highway, whether it's even even an interchange. This just all takes time. And so the president at the time was described to him as being shovel ready, but really weren't quite as shovel ready as what he thought. And that is one of the contributing factors because a lot of the stimulus was not in the form of 
cash to, 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 to households like the COVID stimulus, work, stimulus uh, uh, payments were, but instead was were projects for infrastructure, which I think is, is a good thing, is a good plan. I don't uh, disagree, but it took a while to get out of that recession. It's a very slow, long climb out of recession, and um, and some uh, sort of critique that whole policy is being too slow. And I think the evidence for the fact that people believe that is because of the fact that the next, you know, I'm sure we had due to COVID, we just simply gave money to people. Said, here you go, here's money, uh, which is a pretty good thing. I mean, and I know economists have been talking for years about. What are you going to be calling me going to just write checks to people? And of course, that doesn't sound like uh, something that's very smart to a lot of people, but in fact, it was pretty stimulant. Maybe it was overly stimulant. I don't know. And then a couple final things here is I want to sort of compare and contrast monetary policy, which we talked a bit about last week and the week before, versus the fiscal policy that we're talking about today, and sort of say, okay, what are the, the benefits, the pros and cons of either of these policies? And, and, if it looks like I'm sort of coming down on the side of monetary policy, it's because of the thing, in fact, most economists believe monetary policy from a stabilization perspective, particularly in terms of reining the economy in that is trying to slow it down, monetary policy is probably more effective. So we talk about the benefits of monetary policy, it's faster than fiscal policy because fiscal policy has all these lags and then we have a much shortened administrative and implementation lag. And by that, I mean, if you consider the fact that during the 2008-2009 financial crisis, Federal Reserve Open Market Committee, which makes the policy for monetary policy, um, had emergency meetings from time to time. They'd say, everybody, can you all be in Washington tomorrow? And so they all get on planes and fly from San Francisco and Minnesota and, and wherever to be there to meet. And that's not always the case with Congress. Sometimes Congress is not even there on their recess. Maybe the president doesn't want to sign whatever Congress comes up with. The FOMC has an odd number of members, and so they simply take a majority of vote, um, and it's much, much, much faster. They can arrive at decisions really within a day or two. So this, this, the recognition lag is always going to be there with fiscal or monetary policy, and there are lags in monetary policy also. I think it's clear that we shouldn't say there's no lag with monetary policy. It's just a shortened because of the fact that you can inject money into the economy or take money out a little bit quicker then you can increasing government spending or, or cutting taxes. Political pressure is usually much less critical. We've talked about that before, but there are some shortcomings in monetary policy, which is where fiscal policy has some virtues and some advantages over it. That is sometimes reducing money growth is easier than increasing it since investment may not respond to monetary incentives. What do I mean by that? This has been described as pushing on strength. That is sometimes you can you can take money out of the economy much faster than you can put money in if you're the monetary policy authority. Because why? Because one of the ways that we get monetary policy to work is by getting private actors to, to sort of take the bait. I know that sounds like maybe the wrong way to, way to phrase that, but in other words, to respond to the incentive of a lower, in, lower interest rate to go borrow money. But if people don't want to borrow money for whatever reason, you can't make them, you can't force them to borrow. And, and nor can you even force banks to. We saw this during the, the financial crisis, beginning around 2009, when the Treasury Secretary at the time, which I know is not the monetary authority, but the Treasury Secretary, who does regulate banks, said, look, if I can't, if banks don't want to lend money, I'm not going to make them do it. So as a result, even if rates are low, 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 you can't make people lend or borrow either one. And so as a result, you can't necessarily boost the money supply and the multiplier effect resulting from monetary stimulus if the economy doesn't want to do it. In fact, it was something called the liquidity trap, which was first described by Keynes back in the 30s. And it was sort of thought to be the sort of unicorn. I've mean, never seen it before. We talked about how it could happen. Rates get so low because the economy is flat on its back, but nobody wants to borrow because there's no, there's no point in borrowing. To do what? To repay money with interest and there's no benefit in doing it. So, and there's no point in lending money because you're not sure if you're going to be repaid at very low interest rates to begin with. Why would you want to lend money at very low rates when uh, things are already weak? So that's one issue, pushing on the string. It's difficult, you can pull it out, pull money out, but you can't push it in. There's often occasional ambiguity of what that should do in any given time. And what I think uh, a lot of people realize, even people in the financial world, because we've been hearing for the last, oh gosh, nine months at least from people in the financial world, hey, the Federal Reserve should cut rates. Or they've raised the rates, rates too fast, too far, too far, too fast. 
Uh, now they need to cut rates. Well, I don't think the Fed is prepared to cut rates anytime soon. Even though I think they're now talking about, okay, maybe one more increase in rates in May, and then we're done for a while. We'll see what happens. But I don't know that they know. I, don't, I mean, I think they don't really know. And after the bank failures of First Republic and Silicon Valley Bank, I think there was a lot of ambiguity over what the Fed should do. Because, look, the reason that, that Silicon Valley in particular, I'm much more familiar with the Silicon Valley case than I am the First Republic case. There's another bank whose name I don't recall at hand. But, but Silicon Valley um, had too many bonds that were had too low of rates. And when, as we've seen before in this class, if interest rates go up, bond prices go down. They were taking losses. And so the question was, okay, Federal Reserve, if you keep raising rates, this problem is only going to get worse from every bank in, in the country that's got bonds on their portfolio, which is, oh, I don't know, every one of them. And so maybe you shouldn't raise rates anymore. In fact, maybe you should think about cutting rates that would bring bond prices maybe a little bit back up, which would uh, counter the problem that first Republican and, and including particularly Silicon Valley Bank had, those two bank failures, or three bank failures. I can't recall the third bank failure. Look that up, but um, so there's ambiguity, and not only that, but even in, even in the best of times, I mean, I, I can recall that there would be occasions in which the Federal Reserve wouldn't do anything monetary policy wise for a couple of years. Not that they because they were doing their jobs and they were all taking a two year vacation, no, it wasn't at all. It just it didn't seem like there was any need to do anything with rates up, down, whatever. And so, uh, and if you don't need to do anything, it's kind of like the economy's on autopilot, so to speak. Don't mess with the controls if things are going well. And so I think that is, is the case, even though there are always voices out there saying, do this, do that. And everyone's got an opinion as to what the Federal Reserve should do and um, that sort of thing. Uh, the Fed's work can be countered by Congress. Um, we see this occasionally, particularly when the Federal Reserve is trying to take the punch bowl away when the party gets going. That's the metaphor that was once used by a Fed chairman when, when the economy is going really well. Prices start to heat up, and so we're there to take the punch bowl away from the party. But Congress may have other ideas. They want to keep spending, and, 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 may, and so may the president. So, and by the way, the Fed chairman that said that, is famous for saying that again, William Chesney Martin was Fed chairman during the 60s, and was really a, an inflation hawk. That is, he wanted to prevent against inflation. However, he was his work was going up against Congress and the president. And Lyndon Johnson at the time was spending money like vast amounts of money just and just incredible amounts of money on all kinds of things, which probably needed to have been addressed at some point. Things like um, student aid and, and, and Medicare for elderly people, Medicaid for the needy, uh, you know, expansion of all those kinds of, of programs, expansion of some of the some of the bureaucracy in the federal government, um, uh, civil rights uh, uh, laws, and the implementation of those, uh, which all had involved government action. Uh, but it was probably, uh, you know, it, it was pushing against what the Federal Reserve was trying to do. And so, and that's really my, my main idea here is the fact that the Fed's going one way, they're hitting the brakes, the Fed, Fed's hitting the brakes, Congress, the president, stepping on the gas. And so you have this push pull and this does happen. So these are some issues here. And that's got, you know, this is where the conflict between monetary and fiscal policy, sometimes the rubber hits the road. Also, private actors may sometimes attempt to anticipate the Fed's policies, thereby upsetting the timing. This goes back to, this thing that we call the rational expectations theory, which we talked about in chapter 13, where it's, it's part of the, uh, the neoclassical perspective, even though there's a Keynesian point of view on this whole idea of rational expectations. Remember the idea behind it, and I, I don't even know I would call it a theory, it's called RET, rational expectations theory, but it's really more about sort of a worldview. And that is, hey, this is, the way, this is, what, this is where we are with economics right now. There's so much information out there. We all see things happen in real time in terms of things like interest rates and oil prices and employment data and inflation data. And we can and we see purchasing manager surveys, all this data that comes in. We're all seeing it more or less at the same time. And the Federal Reserve gets it maybe a day before anybody else. A day. That's, that's really it. And so because of that, we're all sort of making decisions to anticipate what the Fed's going to do. And so as a result, the Fed is not surprising us, which is where the idea of Surprising the public has thought in the RET mindset to, to work effectively. But the Federal Reserve hasn't really been able to pull off too many surprises lately. But I will say this in defense of the Fed, and maybe to sort of argue against the RET theory a little bit, is the fact that um, the Federal Reserve is trying to be much more transparent in what they do. And they have been since Ben Bernanke was chairman. 
That was a couple of chairmen ago. Chairman, chairmen, chairmen, well, chairman, uh, anyway, one of chairpersons. <laughs> and uh, he tried to be much more uh, transparent, less opaque than what they had been in the past. So as a result, um, they that's not what they want to do anyway. They don't want to surprise. In fact, there was an interview with uh, that I read. I, I do try to follow what the Fed Reserve members are saying, and I think it was the Cleveland Fed, Loretta Meister, Fed president, who said, "Look, I was prepared back in in February to raise the rate half a percent, but the public wasn't expecting it. So we all sort of thought the public wasn't ready for it, so we raised all rates only a quarter of a percent." It tells me that they really are concerned with the fact that they, act, that they don't want to support the the, uh, the actors in the economy because they said they were ready to go a half a percent. They only went a quarter of a percent as an, as an increase. Remember, they've been on the gauge now in the better part of a year for raising rates, a little over a year now, raising rates, raising rates, trying to slow the economy down, stamp out borrowing. It's having an effect, uh, but uh, that's one issue. Okay, and then one final, so any questions about that, this, this comparing and contrasting a monetary and fiscal policy. Final thing I'll talk about, I put this in quotes because it's something that I, I, I want everybody to know. It's something that's talked about more than it is um, sort of standard economic theory. It's something called the political business act. It's the idea that some people have that suggests, I think it's more of the everyday person has the idea. Sometimes the government tries to wreck things prior to elections. And then once the election's over, the hammer falls. They do things like raise taxes and cut government spending and cut benefit programs to things like Medicare and Medicaid and veterans benefits and all that. It's the idea that, that, that politicians are sort of up to their own games. And they're, sort of, they're sort of manipulating things for their own benefit. I don't personally think there's a lot of evidence to support that, frankly, but I think a lot of people believe it is. And I think a lot of people take actions based upon the fact that I think they think this is a real thing that um, politicians are sort of rigging things and then after the election, after they're safely reelected, then they do things which are unpopular. The problem is that even in a modern economy like today, we're all aware of what Congress is doing. And even though the discussions might go on behind closed doors, the policy has got to be passed in public. And so I don't know that that's really the case. Maybe one time that might've been, but I think that in an economy like ours, where everyone's got a lot of information and we're all looking and seeing what's happening, and we're all forming our own ideas and some of them wrong well, judgments. I think a lot of people have had this whole interest rate thing wrong for a long time um, that the Federal Reserve may stop raising rates or they may cut rates. And I think a lot of us in the econ profession are saying, no, they're not going to cut rates. They're trying to raise rates. Um, so people could be wrong, but there's information available. And I think we all know what's happening that, that very little happens now that in, in terms of actual policy implementation that doesn't get caught. So even things that are Weird line items on budgets that somebody sneaks in. Somebody usually sniffs it out and we hear about it. Not that everybody in the country hears about it, but we, we sort of figure out what's what's happening. Okay. All right. So that does it for fiscal policy chapter 17. I those slides I believe are posted. Yeah, they're, they're available on the Brightspace site. Um, one thing I wanted to mention to everybody, and it's um, and this is my bad, but I, but I want everybody to circle back to week 13. In the PowerPoint slides, because I updated those yesterday, and I realized that there were some slides that were missing, and I was fiddling around with these to better suit this particular text. We used a different text for years and years and years, and, I, and the order of the slides was a little bit different because I wanted to sort of match up that not everything was talked about in the old text that was talked about in this text, and vice versa. So I simply replaced the file, the PowerPoint package, in week 13. Is no longer there. It's 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 not anything less. It's just more. It's just more slides, and it's a little bit more comprehensive in terms of this idea of foreign exchange, and give me examples as to what that's about. So take a look at that. Just make a note that that's there, and obviously you've got that available to use for the exam, um, and that's um, one of the benefits to taking an online exam. Obviously, is that you've got uh, pretty much whatever resources are available to you to use uh, as you see fit. Okay. All right, so uh, that's just a little bit of uh, updates there. Any questions for me about anything at all regarding fiscal policy and, and, and all, the, all of that? So, okay, well, that's pretty much all the content. You know what I know, I, I should say. Well, maybe not. <laughs> it's kind of, kind of dangerous to say. You know exactly what I know. I, you know, I know nothing about the macro. <laughs> that's not exactly true. So. So let's talk a bit about um, the exam, exam four, and what to expect. Well, this is not 
no, no real surprises here because it's gonna it's gonna be the same um, format as before. Forty multiple choice questions, okay? And uh, you know how to answer multiple choice times two and a half points each, so hundred points possible. Keep in mind to remember that uh, of the first four exams, and this is the fourth of those intermediate exams. I dropped the lowest score, okay? And I'll probably remind you this again next time because sometimes. You know, as I'm grading, as I'm putting the grades together, dropping the lowest scores, people oftentimes call me just freaking out. Hey, the best score went to zero on exam two. But yes, I know it's because you dropped the lowest score. People think I'm like manipulating grades. That's what it means to drop the scores to zero it out. So I'll drop the lowest score. The final exam we can't we can't drop, so it's got it's got to be there. So uh, we'll require you have the final exam, but I will drop the lowest score. So I mean, it's good for you though, because if you have a bad day. You know, I mean, I know that, you know, and I've long said that our students are busy, they've got jobs, some of them have families, and so, you know, it's busy. And so I, I want to try to make this as, um, you know, uh, as, as realistic, given our situation, our student situation, uh, as possible. And so I think dropping low school is, is appropriate. So it's 40 multiple choice question in Brightspace. You'll see it available probably, uh, ooh, it'll be sometime today or tonight. I'll try to get it available as soon as I'm able. We've got a little bit of work to do on it, but it's, it's going to be available. It's going to cover chapters, let me see, 15, 16, and 17. Chapters 15, 16, and 17. Okay, so only three chapters are ever there. 15 deals with uh, monetary policy and bank regulation. There isn't as much in bank regulation as there is in monetary policy, frankly. Uh, it's the more important part of this. I've said this before, but a lot of this, uh, if you want to learn more about bank regulation and whatnot, uh, money and banking is your next class. It's a 300 level econ course generally. And then we get much more into that. Uh, we don't teach it here, obviously. So we don't teach the 300 level, but that's that's there. So monetary policy and bank regulation. I'll talk about what to know about some of that. International trade is chapter 16. Particularly, there's a lot of emphasis on currency exchange, that's what we call foreign exchange. And uh, you want to know about that. And I'll go over the exam, what to expect here in a second. Then chapter 17 deals with fiscal policy. So that is what is going to be covered there, okay? So let's talk about the exam and what to expect on this exam. It'll be available later. Um, okay, so again, 40 multiple choice. Oh, you have 90 minutes. I, I don't think I mentioned 20 minutes. So I guess it's the very same format as before and um, something too unique or different as far as that goes. And so that's what you can expect uh, for the exam. So let's take a look at what to expect on the exam. Okay. Um, okay, so there are questions dealing with um, who are the actors involved in monetary and fiscal policy, okay? So fiscal policy is run by Congress and the president in our country, and then the central bank, our Federal Reserve, is in charge of monetary policy. And one of the things to know about them that I've said over and over again, that, that the fiscal policy authorities are elected, elected and that uh, the Monetary policy authorities are appointed. So they're, they're different, how they get their jobs are different. That's an important distinction because of the fact that the Federal Reserve and the members of the FOMC generally, who are not members of the board, but are these rotating district presidents are not elected by the public and they're simply they're appointed. And so they've got no real political uh, pressure placed on them really. I mean, I don't know that too many of them have any kind of political aspiration. I certainly have never seen anybody who have left, who's left to run for elective office. I don't think I've ever seen anybody who's on the Federal Reserve Board or FOMC do that. I'm not saying it's never happened, but it's by design. It's to insulate them from the political influences that might uh, cause them to make a decision which is just popular and not the correct thing to do, okay? Uh, also, know about what these the, what reserve requirements are. So we talked about reserves and we went, and some of this began back in this, the chapter where we talked about money creation as performed by banks. We talked about what reserves were and reserves are, are kind of a beautiful thing for a bank. That is somebody brings to you their paycheck or their savings or whatever they say here, you create a liability, but it also creates an asset. So it's, it's your money, you the bank to be able to do what you can do as long as it's full. And, um, and sometimes the, the Federal Reserve requires some of that to be set aside. It's called a required reserve. And it's really used to, to control the money supply. If the reserve ratio goes up, the money supply goes down because why? It means more money is out of play in the economy and it's sitting on the bench. It's like a player coming out of the game, sitting on the bench. 
And if the, and that, is there, that reserve requirement is lower, that player comes off the bench and gets into the, into the game. So that's one sort of sports metaphor to look at that. So required reserve ratios are important uh, from that standpoint. Also know about, since we're talking about uh, reserve requirements, um, know about the, 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 the money multiplier. Even though I think we went over this from the beginning, it, it does come up in monetary policy. The money multiplier, which is simply the, the value of M, is simply the reciprocal of the required reserve ratio. And so if you have a 10% required reserve ratio, the multiplier is going to be 10. And if the Federal Reserve lowers that to 5%, the multiplier doubles to 20. So what can we say about the multiplier? If the reserve ratio goes up, the multiplier goes down. That is the, and the multiplier is simply that factor which magnifies some change in the money supply to ripple through the economy. And if that ratio goes down, the multiplier goes up. That's very similar to like the long demand, the inverse relationship between those. And it's simply because one is, the, the multiplier is simply the inverse of that reserve ratio, okay? So monetary expansion, uh, whether it's done by the Fed or whether it's done by the private sector through banks, it, is, it works through that multiplier effect, which is a function of the reciprocal of the reserve ratio, okay? All right, um, let's see here. Trying to get my, I'm, I'm sorry my camera's bouncing around here and uh, every room I've been in, I know since for every room I'm in, it, it, it's like the switches are set backwards and so, I never knew which, which way to go here, but uh, okay, uh, let's see. I also want to know about um, all these tools of monetary policy. There are three tools. One is the reserve ratio, reserve requirements, percentage of deposits, banks have to set aside. Know about the discount rate. That's another one. The discount rate is this rate that Federal Reserve can lend to banks and other institutions like mortgage companies and the Fannie Mae and all that. And it's a rate that is available to be uh, to be charged by Fed to bank lending. And then the last one is open market operations. So open market operations is the active buying and selling of government securities. Okay, so that's what that's what the discount rate is, is that particular mechanism. Okay. And then of those, you want to know, and we went over this in class, what is, what's the relative effectiveness of these, uh, these tools? And we said that of the three tools, the first two really weren't very effective at controlling the money supply. Reserve requirements, not very effective, mostly because Number one, the Fed doesn't change them very often. In fact, they're, I think they're probably on the way to getting rid of them altogether. If I had to guess, I'd say they probably wouldn't. They're, they used to be more important than what they are. It started out, they were there to, to as a cushion against bank runs. But bank runs, despite the fact that we have one at Silicon Valley Bank, they're pretty rare anymore. Even the financial crisis where banks were failing, we didn't really have any bank runs. And so that's not very effective. The discount rate is not very effective because it's, there's a stigma that's been going on for decades. Federal Reserve has been trying to change the attitudes of bankers and say, look, it's okay to borrow from the Federal Reserve uh, directly through the discount window. It's the mechanism. But banks don't want to do it. They think it's like borrowing from Big Brother and uh, they don't want to do it. So it's not very effective. Open market operations are far away more effective. And by the way, as we get further into this particular um, version of the Federal Reserve that we're in, these, these current members, the Fed funds rate is going to be much, much more important. Remember what the Fed funds rate is. It's the rate that banks lend each other, not the Fed to the banks, lend each other overnight. And that's what the Federal Reserve, whenever you hear on the news, the Federal Reserve raised rates or did whatever, lowered rates. It's the Fed funds rate and the discount rate together. They just usually put them in tandem. I don't think they want a differential between those. But it's that Fed funds rate that is really what is probably even more important than open market operations, believe it or not. Um, and, and I know your textbook doesn't present it that way, but this is a fairly new change. And anybody who looks at the Federal Reserve will look at, at some of the most recent statements. And in fact, some of the publications that the Federal Reserve is putting out now saying, we're really looking hard at the Fed funds rate as being a tool of monetary policy, kind of a fourth tool, okay? But you want to know what's relatively weak and what's relatively weak of the discount rate and reserve operations. Now, two about what, what it means to engage in open operations. What is the definition? It's the active buying and selling of government securities by the Federal Reserve. And if the Fed is buying, they're doing what? They're putting money into play. They're injecting money into the economy because somebody who was holding a, a bond on Thursday now holds cash because the Fed bought it from them. On Friday, they now hold, hold cash. So as a result, there's money being put into play in the economy. When the Fed's selling bonds, they're saying that, that somebody who's holding cash has now got a bond later in the week because they bought it from the Fed, who has sold it to them. 
So it's taking money out of the economy. And by the way, I think the Fed is very quietly doing that, selling bonds to withdraw money from the economy. I think we're starting to see that. But know what that means and what happens when the Fed does these things respectively. Okay. Okay. Um, and then know about what happens if the Fed changes the reserve ratio. What does that mean? If the rate goes down, it means there's more ability to make loans. If the, if the ratio goes up, it means there's less ability to make loans. And so just know about what that important relationship is between uh, the, 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 the reserve rate and what banks can actually do. If they lower the rate, it means more, they've got more money to play with. So, okay, that is to lend or invest. <laughs> okay, um, also know about the connection. I just mentioned it, the connection between the discount rate and the Fed funds rate. They move together. Even though the discount rate is considered to be a fairly weak tool, it is somewhat symbolic, I think, and I think I may have mentioned that when we sort of laid out the effectiveness. It's mostly symbolic. It doesn't really mean that much. It, particularly if nobody's using it, um, it's mostly symbolic. Fed funds rate right, much more important, okay? Um, okay, let me see here. I'm just going through the exam. Um, I thought the multiplier, what that happened, what, mean, what that means. So if the... Remember, this reserve ratio is, is totally managed by the Federal Reserve. And so that multiplier is going to respond simply because of what the Federal Reserve chooses to do uh, with that. And so the multiplier is just going to simply be a, a reaction to it. The multiplier doesn't act on, on things. It's the reserve ratio that acts on things. That affects the multiplier. Okay, So that, well, that rate goes down, the multiplier goes up. The rate goes up, the multiplier goes down. Okay, So just know about that as being a real thing. Okay. Let's see here. Uh, okay, we talked about the Fed funds rate. Make sure you are familiar with how important that rate is. Now, I didn't get into this so much this time. In fact, I sort of jumped over it a little bit, but I want to go back to this, um, this thing called the quantity theory of money. And we talked about this back, I believe, in chapter 13, because it's really, it was a, a um, sort of a hallmark of Milton Friedman's thinking back in the 60s and 70s where he sort of revived a, a, a theory that said that, that the, the very famous quantity money theory, MV equals BQ, okay? M stands for the supply of money. B stands for velocity of money. Remember what velocity of money was? It's simply the number of times the money supply turns over. You can think about GDP, about velocities being this, it's basically GDP by the supply, because this, this is the money supply right here, supply of money. And so, in other words, in a twenty-six trillion dollar economy, we don't need twenty-six trillion dollars of money because it's going to turn over. It's recyclable. So, the money I spend today is going to be spent by somebody else next week. It's going to move. It's going to move. It's it's it's, it's recyclable. So, velocity of money is the number of times it turns over. P is the price of goods. Quantity is the is the quantity of goods. And so, there are just a couple of questions dealing with what happens if one of these things go up. So, if this goes up and this goes up and this goes goes up, well, then probably you know this is going to go up as well. Just knowing how the math works on this, and so and you can just insert numbers and play around with that a little bit. But um, and you can kind of read that for yourself. We talked about this a little bit early on. It's simply, it's called the quantity theory of money, and um, just be familiar with how that how that works, what the mechanism is. If you can think about the fact, just look at it this way: if if this is the uh, the the money side of the economy, right? The green arrows here. And I, for whatever reason, don't have a red marker today, so my apologies. Um, I'll use a blue marker. So, oh, yes, I did. Well, wait, did I forget? No, I guess I didn't. All right, whatever. But I usually have a lot of markers on me. I'm the marker king. And this is the, the economy, or the physical flow, then are sort of matching up with one another. They have to equal each other because it doesn't make sense that they cannot equal each other. So, Remember, the real economy is this term that we use sort of informally back, I don't know, week one, week two, say, okay, there's this economy that we're familiar with, we go buy goods, we pay for goods, and yet there's a money economy that's a little bit less obvious, that's money flipping over, turning over, and whatnot, and so you just kind of want to be familiar with that, that particular equation, it's the quantity theory of money, okay? Uh, okay, let me see, what's next here? Um, and you can stop me anytime if you have questions, feel free to, to, to do that. Let me... Um, I want to make sure that uh, you see that. I'm, I'm trying to be sensitive to the to the camera. This is a little bit new to us. I mean, that's most I've been doing this a while. Most of us usually aren't familiar with how to play to the camera, so we're not we're not actors, and so we uh, I want to be sensitive to that. So just be familiar with that 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 equation there. Okay. 
All right. Um, okay, so just to be familiar with that and what that's about. Uh, let's see here. Um, okay, the question is about fiscal policy. We talked about the difference between budget deficits or whatever taxes are insufficient to cover government spending. So budget deficit results when what? When the, when taxes are less than government spending. That is government spending more than it takes in, so you have a deficit, right? This is a budget deficit. And when taxes exceed government spending, we have a budget surplus. These are budget surpluses. And so as a result of this, we have different means by which to deal with it. But just know what a deficit is. It's a shortfall in taxes in relation to money uh, coming in to the government, okay? So know about what those are about. And then obviously, if we have taxes equal to government spending, then we have a balanced budget, okay? And again, it doesn't have to... I mean, I think it's, I think there's probably some tolerance here that most people would accept as a balanced budget. Uh, in reality, oops, that should be T equals G, not T minus G. T equals G, balanced budget. Um, we don't have to balance to the penny, but, you know, if it's close, then we have what's called balanced budget. Usually we're in surplus or deficit, usually deficit. That's usually our experience, okay? All right. Uh, da, 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 da. Know about, okay. Well, we, talk, we talked a bit about taxes and tax rates. So there are two, well, there, there are at least two different kinds of tax systems based upon people's incomes. Now, there's a reason why I went back. In fact, I think I've got this up on, oh, wait, hold on a second. I mean, I've got this up on the screen here where we talked, I think it's on this slide. Here we go, yeah, principles of taxation. The ability to pay principal, the ability to pay principal is based upon this idea that, that rather than taxing people for the benefits that they get, our theory of this is the fact we'd rather tax people who are better able to pay. So it's the ability to pay principle, which is really the operative income tax principle in the country. And again, these slides are available in your PowerPoint slide. This is week 14. And it's the idea that if those who are able to pay the most tax do pay the most tax, and we so we call it a progressive tax system. So people who earn more pay more, and that's that's by design. Not just in dollars, but also in percentages. So if the percentages are higher, then certainly the dollars have got to be higher. But but the idea is to charge them a higher tax rate because they're better able to pay than the low-income people who may have no taxes at all. There are a lot of households that, that don't pay income taxes, not because they're cheating the government. They just simply don't owe taxes. And they're not required. In fact, they may even get tax rebates or credits. Um, and they may have a negative federal income tax and even a negative state income tax. It does happen. And it's by design that we have what they're called refundable tax credits, earned income credit, child tax credit being the two things sort of come to mind. And uh, we have a couple versions of that in New Mexico as well. But uh, those are examples of progressive tax. We tax those who have the least ability to pay less, those who have the most ability to pay more. Now, progressive taxes give rise to these ever increasing and graduated tax brackets. But keep in mind that there are some taxes that can be regressive in nature. And regressive taxes work the opposite way. And I, did, I, I went through a little bit of an example of that in class. And that would be, one example is the sales tax. Sales taxes tend to be regressive. And so um, that is, it, it tends to, to fall, the bigger burden tends to fall on lower income households or the higher income households. And the reason for that is the fact, if we go back to that, those distinctions between consumption and savings, lower income households spend a greater percentage of their income. So therefore, more of their income is subject to, to sales taxation because they, they're able to save less. If you're able to save a lot of your income because your income is high, then it simply evades sales tax. And so any tax that taxes those with lower incomes higher than higher incomes is a regressive tax. And so there are examples of regressive ta sales taxes are one of those. Uh, there have also been uh, criticisms of things like lotteries as being regressive taxes. And I know this is, I've had endless number of discussions with people about lotteries and whether or not they're a good thing or a bad thing. And, and I know that New Mexico, they do help to fund higher education and I am for that. Um, so I'm a little bit conflicted on it because I think, um, I, I think lotteries are not a, a great thing generally, but that's just my own particular uh, point of view, I guess. Okay, all right. So there are a couple of questions dealing with, you'll, you'll, you'll be given uh, someone's income and their tax rate. And you'll want to basically, it'll be comparing and contrasting two different parties, just a matter of doing the math, just have a little calculator. It's not, the math is not huge, but it's just simply say who pays, what kind of tax is this? If Peter pays more than 
then it must mean that Paul Peter makes more if it's a progressive system. If it's if he if he earns more and pays less, it's a regressive system. Okay, so you want to know what that is about. Just very simple calculations, but have a little calculator available. You don't have to. There's not going to be a whole lot of calculations uh, otherwise. Okay. Um, also, know about the difference between deficits and debt at the federal level. So a budget deficit is the annual shortfall of taxes in relation to government spending. So every year that goes by, the federal government spends more than what it takes in. We have a deficit, okay? And that's just simply a reality. But one of the ways, in fact, the primary way that the government finances deficits is by engaging in borrowing. And so because of the fact that we've had budget deficit after budget deficit year after year, the federal, the government, the federal government borrows money from the public. Or whoever, wants to, whoever wants to lend money to the federal government they're free to do so. And so we have the national debt is this accumulation of debt that's been out there for a very long time. And, it, and we just keep refinancing it over and over again. And I, I showed in class on, did I show you guys the, the debt clock on Tuesday? I think I did, didn't I? Yeah. It's kind of mesmerizing, isn't it? You just got to watch all those the numbers are just kind of rolling. And it just gives you, I mean, it's kind of it's kind of a gimmick. It's kind of a little gadget, but I think it's kind of cool. It just kind of shows where we are with federal debt, it, it, we're, we're, our federal debt continues to climb because we spend more than what we take in. And I'm not even saying that's necessarily a bad thing. I think most economists today are of the opinion that if deficit spending were going to crush us, we were going to cave in under the weight, you would have done it by now. Now, if we add another $30 trillion of debt, maybe it will. Uh, but let's find out when we have $30 trillion more debt. By that time, though, maybe our GDP is $80 trillion a year. That's not that outlandish, going from 26 to 80, because I remember my first job as an economist right out of college, I think the GDP was $4 trillion, $4, it's $26 trillion now. So, and I'm, I'm, I'm old, but I'm not that old. So, you know, it's, it has grown and it can grow, uh, it can grow a lot, okay, over time. Okay, uh, let me see here. Uh, da, 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 da. Um, I think, I think I lost my place here, sort of. Let me see here. But, uh, oh, here we go. Uh, okay. Um, okay. Now, you want to know about whether it's monetary or fiscal, what is the expansionary policy? What is the contractionary policy? An expansionary policy is any policy that boosts GDP on you know, aggregate demand. So if it's fiscal policy, it's usually increasing government spending or cut in taxes. Those are both expansionary. Pushes aggregate demand to the right, boosts GDP. Maybe it's inflationary, maybe it's not, but the point is, it's not about inflation, it's about GDP, trying to cure recession and unemployment. If it's monetary policy we're talking about, usually lower reserve ratios or cutting interest rates. Those are expansionary policies. Two different tools, two different actors, but those are expansionary. Contractionary is used to pull the economy the other direction, pull aggregate demand to the left, try to rein in inflation. So if it's fiscal policy, it's a, cut, it's a raise in taxes, a cut in government spending, However, that is not usually done because of the fact it's politically not very popular to do, and elected officials are somewhat loath to do it. It's generally considered to be suicidal, for, particularly for an executive like a president to, to want to do it, so they tend not to. Monetary policy, on the other hand, which is contractual, which is where we have been now for the last year and, and change, and that is raising interest rates and selling government bonds to try to slow the economy down, okay? And by doing that, maybe you can arrest the rise in the inflation rate, which is really what the goal is right now, okay? So talk about expansionary, contractionary, what those are about, what those tools are that allow uh, uh, the, the, the federal government at either level to do that, at the fiscal or monetary level, okay? Uh, okay, um, and know what the definitions of fiscal policy are and monetary policy, those fiscal policy, budget policy, taxation, spending, Monetary policy debt defined as the control of the supply of money and the availability of credit. Okay, um, let me see here. Okay, uh, okay. Some of these I've talked about, so I'm kind of jumping. Okay, so. We also talked, okay, so we talked about why expansionary fiscal policy might be used, and it might be used much more than contractionary policy when there's something going on like what we call a supply shock. Supply shock is simply a leftward shift to aggregate supply. That can be due to a lot of things. And by the way, we just saw it happen with COVID. 
that was a leftward shift in supply, a reduction in supply. Why? Because you know, a lot of the world was, was sort of shut down. So as a result, there wasn't as much supply, so prices were going up. If you just know what happens to a leftward shift in this supply curve, it means that on the price axis, prices are going up and GDP is falling. Both of those happen. So those kind of shocks, unemployment rises, so does uh, inflation. Okay, Unemployment and inflation both go up. And that's noted by a leftward shift in supply. That's what we call a shock, a supply shock. We, we sort of modeled that a bit earlier in the class, but now it's, it's more talking about why we would use fiscal, expansionary fiscal policy to counter that, to move the aggregate demand curve back to the right. Okay, Supply is shifted, but let's boost aggregate demand. <laughs> this is probably why we have the inflation we have at the moment, because of the fact you've got this, this sort of thing going on between uh, fiscal and monetary both. Okay. Okay, um, also we talked about on Tuesday, this idea of the phenomenon that was called crowding out, okay? And um, so remember what this is. Okay, so if the federal government is borrowing, borrowing, borrowing because it's got to finance a bunch of deficits, where does it go? It goes to the private market to borrow money, the market for savings, okay? And if the government is, is borrowing like crazy, it lowers, it makes more scarce the pool of savings available to everybody else. And so if something is more scarce, the price of that, i.e. the interest rate goes up. That's what crowding out is about. But that's not the only source that, that prevents the government from, from or that, that allows the government to borrow because there's also an inflow from abroad. I sort of had this, this little hose, this fire hose from the rest of the world because the rest of the world is buying U.S. government debt and they have been for a very long time. This is the benefit of being the United States. This is why we have a strong military so that our economy is supported because we run continual budget deficits, but we're allowed to do it because we've got big pool of savings and we've got inflows of capital from abroad. And as long as everybody believes the US economy is strong and, and stable, and it is, despite the occasional hiccups and bumps along the way, we're pretty stable compared to everybody else. Um, you know, and we're, we're, pretty, we're a pretty strong house in what is otherwise a, a, a global economy that's a kind of a shaky neighborhood. It, oftentimes, it really is oftentimes shaky. So we're in a pretty good shape. So not just private savings from households and firms, but also inflows, okay? So know about those that those inflows can come in. And therefore, it sort of pushes back against the idea that there may be, um, uh, there may be, uh, you know, crowding out happening, okay? Uh, let me see here a minute. Okay, um, okay, so we can crowd out. We talked about crowding out, what that's about. Okay, so we also talked about this idea of, of exports and imports and what they are. And, and we talked about this earlier. So there's not, these are fairly simple and straightforward. What's an export is a good sold to a foreign buyer, import a good purchase from a foreign seller. That's, I think, pretty straightforward for the most part. And then know what the difference between trade deficits and, budget, and trade surpluses are. So it's a different sort of surplus and deficit than the budget deficit. So, and again, we, we went back to this back in, I think, chapter six. If exports are greater than imports, we have a trade surplus, surplus in trade, meaning that we are getting more inflows from the sale of our goods than we have outflows because of the imports of goods. And so it's the other direction if we have a deficit, okay? And so, and right now the U.S. economy for one thing has a deficit and has had for a very long time meaning that we spend more on foreign-made goods than what the rest of the world buys from us. And that's just simply the reality. Whether or not that's a good thing or a bad thing, I don't think it's anywhere near, frankly, as critical of an issue as the budget deficit, even though we've sort of downplayed the budget deficit a little bit. This is a pretty percentage of GDP historically, so not a big, not a big thing, really. Uh, if it gets bigger, it be, okay? There are a number of questions dealing with currency exchange, and we and, and one of the reasons why I've sort of posted these updated slides is because I think it was a little clearer, and I, I kind of felt as I was going through the class on last week that I was missing something, and I, I, I just kind of got dropped off for some mysterious reason, but they're there now. And so now, about strong and weak currency, what does that mean? If you're if the dollar is rising in value against, say, the euro, or I use the example of Japanese yen, okay. If the dollar is rising against the Japanese yen, it means that Americans can buy more Japanese-made goods because it takes fewer dollars to buy more yen. The goods which are priced in yen then are less expensive, okay? But it's going to be more expensive for Japanese, uh, but it's, it's not going to, so, so as a result, Japanese sellers will benefit. They're selling more goods. 
So their currency is weaker, and that's good for trade if you're a seller. Good for trade if you're a seller. This is why strong and weak are a little bit misleading because sometimes um, countries will push down the value of their currency to allow their sellers to be more competitive with the rest of the world. It has happened. China has, has done it a little bit. There's no real evidence they're still doing it, but they did it, I think, for a while. Britain was very overt about the fact that we're going to push down the value of the British pound to increase exports. The problem with, with diminishing the value of your currency is it can be inflationary, so you can only do that so long. But that's what it means by strong and weak. So if the, if the Japanese, if the U.S. dollar is weak versus the Japanese yen, Japanese goods are going to cost more, and it's also going to be more expensive for Japanese sellers to sell goods to Americans because it, it's more expensive to us. So, so that relationships, there'll be a number of those. And uh, I, I, I did the yen example just because if, if we involve the euro, it's a little bit more complicated because not every country in the eurozone, not every country in the, in, in, in the EU is part of the eurozone. Like Britain is not a member of the, the eurozone and they just left the EU, but, but also like Norway is a member of the EU, but is not a member of the eurozone. So I think it's important not to, to be careful about that. Um, we also question about the interest on the debt, okay? Interest on the debt is a budget item. It's more, this is more discussed in your book than we talked about in class. But the, the one, the problem with federal debt and the, the rise in debt is the fact there's interest on the debt. This is one of the reasons why I pulled up that, that sort of mesmerizing website, the National Debt Clock on, on Tuesday, was because the interest on the debt rises and rises. So there's no way to get out of that. That's what we call non-discretionary. We can't just say, hey, we're not going to pay interest on the debt. That would be a default, and we don't want that to happen. And right now, and I mentioned, and I sort of got into a bit of a discussion about the, the fact that Congress is playing chicken right now with the president over defaulting potentially on the debt. I really don't think that's going to happen. I think it's, but they, you know, whatever, it, we just are kind of along for the ride. But I don't think anybody thinks that we should not pay the federal debt and the interest on the debt. I think that's a bad idea, okay? Um, you want to know, too, about the effects of these currency fluctuations on trade. So if you have a lower dollar, if you're in the U.S., it means our exports can go up because if it's lower relative to the rest of the world, it means that dollar-denominated goods are cheaper, so we can sell more goods abroad. If our currency goes up, we can sell goods less abroad. So we're more likely to have a surplus when we have a lower, weaker currency. If our currency is strong, we tend to have more of a deficit. And... One of the reasons why we've had deficits is because the U.S. dollar has been relatively strong versus other currencies. It's, it's held up pretty well. I mean, it went down against the euro for a number of years, but it's been pretty strong against the euro. It's, it's really been strong against the British pound, which sort of got beaten pretty beaten up pretty hard after they left the euro or the EU zone. But uh, nonetheless, uh, that is what contributes to trade. So know what the effects of trade are going to be on these exchange rate fluctuations, okay? Um, and then there's a question about who really controls monetary policy, and that's, yes, it's the members of the Federal Reserve Board, but it's the FOMC, the Federal Open Market Committee, and that's the body that makes these decisions as to monetary policy, and so they meet about, I think about eight times a year, they, they met in March, last month, they're going to meet again in May, and they usually and they announce, and the chairman, who's now Jerome Powell, will come out and make a speech as to what they decided to do. It's usually not much of a surprise. This last meeting was a little bit of suspense because nobody really knew if they were going to raise rates again, like they have been doing because of what happened to these, these banks, but they decided to carry on with their policy, which I think some of us, I know I expected them to continue to do that, failing banks notwithstanding because it was more important to stop inflation. So, so we'll see what happens. So that's the FOMC that does that. And, um, and, the, and then the tool that we said is becoming more important over time is the Fed funds rate. Even though it's not a formal tool of policy, it is one of the, the, the mechanisms that the Fed is increasingly relying upon to manage the money supply. Okay? All right. Um, I, think, I think that's all that I had to go over with respect to the Zoom. Are there any questions for me about anything that I can answer? Anybody here in the classroom or on the Zoom? On the Zoom call, feel free to uh, give me a shout out. I'll be more than glad to go over anything. Okay, well, the exam will be available later today or this evening, uh, depending on how quickly I can get it up and uh, uh, on, this, on the on Brightspace site. Um, uh, sometimes as we get deeper in the semester, uh, you know, my schedule becomes a little bit more crowded and 
people are you know coming by to deal with semester items and whatnot but uh because uh, I'm here pretty much all day but uh I'll do what I can to get this up uh, up on the screen it'll it'll be available um probably in bright space sometime this evening would be my guess the latest if it's earlier that's fine too if you have any difficulties with the exam as you're taking it over the weekend feel free to give me an email or uh, call me text me whichever you prefer and uh, I'm more than glad to uh, to be able to, to to help you out okay all right well have a great weekend everyone and I'll see you next week <laughs>